approaches a quarter billion dollars. What that means for both parties. Good morning, everyone. How's your client feeling today? He's feeling really good. The latest on the Manafort trial, Michael Cohen, George Papadopoulos, and the multiple Chicago connections to the Mueller probe. We basically have a lot of radishes out, kale, lettuce. Visiting two organic gardens to get a look at what's growing fresh in the city. And we have your thoughts about Illinois toughening up its texting wall driving law in our viewer feedback. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. Another weekend, another rash of shootings. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. Paris, Chicago police say detectives are making progress investigating deadly crimes committed over the weekend. Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson says six people died from gun violence this weekend with another 52 being injured. Of them, he says 26 were known to police through prior arrest or criminal histories. Johnson says Officers also collected 83 illegal guns and arrested 29 more people on gun related charges. He reiterated his call for members of the public to contact police with information related to a crime, as well as his plea for tougher laws for repeat violent offenders. This isn't a widespread issue among Chicagoans. It's the same people. There's a small subset of individuals who think they can play by their own rules because they continue to get a slap on the wrist despite legislation we had passed last year for being a repeat gun offender and breaking the law. And digging for data on police arrests as well as City of Chicago budgets and employees should be easier with the Office of the Inspector General's new information portal. The IG's office explains the portal contains more than 100 ways for users like advocates, public policymakers, researchers and us journalists to visualize city data. For example, city employee information can be sorted by title, department, years of service uh, with the city, as well as salary. In the coming weeks and months, the IG says the office plans to add more dashboards to include complaints against Chicago police officers, as well as CPD and city employee overtime. Meanwhile, the streets of Chicago could be getting a bit brighter as the city's street light modernization plan moves forward. The Chicago Smart Lighting Program says it's installed more than 76,000 new LED street light fixtures across all 50 of the city's wards in its first year. The new LED lights consume 50 to 75 percent less electricity than traditional lights, therefore costing less money to operate. The mayor's office says that could save the city $100 million over 10 years. The program's goal is to replace 270,000 lights over its four year time frame. And as for the weather, showers and thunderstorms tonight with a low around 67. Then tomorrow, a chance of showers and thunderstorms, otherwise mostly cloudy with a high near 78. And if you're missing us and you're on the go, you can get Chicago Tonight by streaming on Facebook or watching via podcast and the PBS video app, as well as online at WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight. Now, Paris, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. According to the latest figures from the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, J.B. Pritzker has raised nearly $128 million in his bid for governor. Incumbent Bruce Rauner is just over $78 million in his funds raised. Now, Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here to take a look at what all of that means. Amanda. Well, Paris, it can be hard to wrap your head around that much money, particularly when, you know, you're not a billionaire or anything. But Which for neither our, of us for, are, no, for the no, record. alas. <laughs> but for our purposes, all that we need to know is it's a lot. And the question is, what do these candidates get out of that money? Well, for starters, the obvious, the ability to air ads like this new one. The Pritzker campaign just rolled out, starring a certain former president of the United States. I am proud to endorse J.B. Pritzker to be the next governor of my home state of Illinois. And let me tell you why. But both candidates are using their money to do a whole lot more as well. And some of it is less obvious. Pritzker says he is entirely self-funding his own campaign. He recently put another infusion of $20 million into it. But he's also spending money to help other candidates, specifically with an effort dubbed the Blue Wave. 
Unlike many down ballot races where there are still limits on campaign contributions, caps are off in the governor's race. So Pritzker's collecting large contributions of $25,000, $30,000 from other donors, and his campaign says all of that is going toward the blue wave. He explained it the other day following Democrats' annual county chairs meeting. Well, this is about what we ought to be doing right in the Democratic Party, and that's making sure that we're competing for voters all across the state in every single county. You heard me say it today, Schuyler County, Grundy County, Johnson County. These are areas that are traditionally people call them red counties. But, you know, there are thousands of Democratic voters in those counties and in all the counties across the state, not just Cook County. You could say that it's similar to Pritzker's opponent, Governor Bruce Rauner, who paved his way to the governor's mansion in a similar fashion, largely self-funding and focus on rebuilding, in his case, the GOP infrastructure. Rauner talked about that at the GOP's recent county chairs meeting. The number one place where I'm giving my money, because it's the number one place where we can create a better future for the children and grandchildren of our state, is to give to the Republican Party of Illinois so we become a major party in this state again. Now, I'm dedicated to that. I'm dedicated to that. So what does all this self-funding, Amanda, mean for the nexus of power in both the Republican and Democratic Party? Well, it can mean a lot because money, of course, is power, particularly in politics. When Rauner came onto the scene, he became the de facto leader of the Illinois GOP. At the start of his term, you saw a lot of Republican lawmakers pretty much in lockstep with him, really in part out of fear that if they stepped out of line, he would fund a candidate against them. It could be similar with Pritzker were he to win the governor's race. Now, mind you, as you just heard from Rauner there, the Democratic Party is stronger overall in state government, so it's not quite elephants to donkeys. House Speaker Michael Madigan, he remains the chair of the Democratic Party of Illinois, and he controls campaign committees he can use to do similar work. That's part of why Madigan is so powerful. But Madigan doesn't have the personal wealth to do what Pritzker's doing. Also, Madigan's generally put more attention toward electing Democrats to the Illinois House than he has to building the party up from the local level. So let's say Pritzker were to win the governor's race, it could raise the question, would he become the real Democratic Party boss in Illinois? Would candidates and lawmakers be more prone to look to Pritzker with his own deep pockets? Is there any consensus uh, to that question well, in the party? <laughs> well, it, frankly, it means that they don't have to rely as much on us, Paris, on what the industry calls earned media. For instance, the debate schedule. In May, Pritzker announced he would take part in three media-sponsored television debates, two in Chicago, one in Quincy, but that was not a schedule agreed to by Rauner. And his campaign says the governor is willing to participate in 10 around the state, but that, quote, unfortunately, Pritzker isn't willing to do the same. Now, it's not clear which 10 those are, but both candidates turned down Chicago tonight's request to have a debate on our show. Amanda, thank you so much. And up next, a look at the Paul Manafort trial and its Chicago connections. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. The jurors deliberated for another extra long day in the Paul Manafort trial with no major questions of the judge and no verdict. There are 18 bank and tax fraud counts against President Donald Trump's former campaign chairman. But Manafort and his lead lawyer say they aren't worried. I think with the jury clearly deliberating longer, it favors your client? I do. And he does. Joining us now to share his insights into day three of the Manafort jury deliberations and more on the Chicago connections to the Mueller investigation is Renato Mariotti, who was an assistant U.S. attorney from 2007 to 2016. He's a partner in the law firm Thompson Coburn and recently was a candidate for the Democratic nomination for attorney general. Renato, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Thank you. First of all, deliberations now will head into day four. Are you 
uh, in agreement with Paul Manafort's attorneys that this is good news for the defense? I think it's, it's definitely good news for them. If there was going to be a very quick verdict in a case like this, it was going to be for the prosecution. There was 18 counts. There was a lot of evidence put in, a lot of damning, incriminating evidence. So if there was going to be a quick verdict to be for the prosecution, I think what the defense is hoping for is for a hung jury. Having one juror who is separate and apart from the other 11 who would go their own way and say, I'm not willing to sign that verdict verdict. In a criminal trial, you need to have an agreement amongst all 12 jurors, so that could be a good sign for the Manafort team. What are the ramifications for the Mueller investigation at large if it is a hung jury? Well, uh, certainly we're going to hear a lot more from the president and his team that this is a witch hunt, that this is rigged, et cetera. A lot of their talking points trying to undermine uh, and uh, attack the Mueller investigation. I think, it, to be clear, I think if I was a betting man at this point, I would still uh, think that you're going to have a guilty verdict on, on at least some or most counts. Um, you know, And that could either mean a compromise verdict in which the jury uh, compromises with the holdout to have not guilty on certain counts, guilty on others, or it could mean guilty on many counts in a hung jury on some. So you have uh, uh, the jurors sending a question to the judge to ask uh, him to define reasonable doubt. Is that a sign of trouble for the prosecution? Well, I'll tell you, I had that happen to me when I was a prosecutor. Uh, it wasn't my happiest moment. Uh, we ultimately had a compromise verdict in that case, uh, a verdict in which some uh, counts were guilty, some not guilty. It, it's a fairly common thing, and what it usually signifies is that there is a holdout or two, and the rest of the jury is trying to convince that person that their concerns don't amount to reasonable doubt. Now, this is a non-sequestered jury. How can it not impact uh, any person when, when there's a constant stream of tweeting and the story is all over the news every day. Is there really, is there really any way for a juror to, to not pay attention to that? Look, there are ways, I'll tell you, it's remarkable uh, when, you, when you go out there in the public, there's a lot of people who aren't paying attention to this at all. But I will say when the President of the United States himself is talking about the trial and, you know, wishing well to the defendant and, and attacking the prosecutors, that is going to have an impact. It's hard for me to believe that uh, everyone in that jury uh, was, was protected and, and sequestered from that. And that's got to be a concern for the prosecution at this point. But with the, between, the pros, with, between the President and the defense amplifying the President point. Uh, what is there one juror out there who feels an affinity for the president who's going to be a holdout? All right, let's talk about the Chicago connection in this trial. Stephen Kalk, uh, the Chicago banker who loaned Manafort $16 million and then was found to be uh, asking for jobs in the Trump administration. Is there a crime here on Stephen Kalk's part? Well, certainly prosecutors felt that he was a co-conspirator. They actually made that assertion to the judge as part of the trial that he was part of the bank fraud scheme or conspiracy with um, with Paul Manafort. Uh, what that meant uh, for purposes of what they were trying to do is that they were able to get evidence into in regarding his statements because that's an exception to the to the rule for evidentiary purposes. But the broader point is that they believe that they could show the judge by a preponderance of the evidence, in other words, 51 percent, that he was a co-conspirator, uh, which is pretty serious business. Uh, but that does not mean, just to be clear to people at home, that they could prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And at this time, they haven't brought charges. So is, is that him. why you think they don't bring charges against him? I think at this point, they, they probably felt that it was too much of a risk to bring charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, prosecutors are usually pretty cautious about the, the charges that they bring. It's possible they will down the line, uh, perhaps with the cooperation of somebody, but they haven't at this point. All right. Also in the Mueller orbit news, reports now that Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, might be uh, indicted on $20 million of bank fraud charges. What's your reaction to this news? Well, it's a very serious problem for uh, Michael Cohen. It, it explains why he's been so concerned uh, and has sort of gone, undergone a public meltdown of, of sorts, talking to all sorts of different people about his feelings and the situation that he's in. It's never a good thing when you're indicted in a case like that by federal prosecutors. Paul Manafort uh, is, is giving us a, a window into what that can be like. So Michael Cohen is uh, really in a situation where you know he's going to have to come up with something in order to get a deal or he's got to hope for a pardon. Can you remind us the, the Chicago connections with Michael Cohen are part of these possible charges related to his ownership of taxi cab medallions in Chicago? That's right. And, you know, we, it's important for folks at home to recall that this case was spun off 
off from the Mueller investigation. It's not being handled by Mr. Mueller. It's being handled by an independent team of prosecutors in Manhattan because these these charges are, are not related as far as we know to the main Mueller investigation. There are taxi cabs both in um, New York and here in Chicago with very colorful names. I think one of them had a series of violations here in Chicago. There was a lot of press coverage of some of that, but the long and short of it is that he allegedly lied to banks in order to get financing. Uh, that is a federal crime and uh, Paris have got Mr. Cohen into some trouble. And do you believe that that if he if he does strike a plea deal on these charges that 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 will relate to the Mueller investigation. I mean, a plea deal would mean that he'll cooperate in the Mueller investigation, even though you say this has been spun off. So whenever you agree to a plea deal with federal prosecutors, you have to agree to help them in any investigation. So often there are there are people who are uh, what we call them flippers, cooperators, who end up helping in a variety of investigations across the country. The more help you provide to the government, uh, the better your deal is. And for someone like Mr. Cohen, who could be facing eight, nine, ten years in in a bank fraud uh, case, uh, he's got a lot of cooperation due to try to get that number down. Part of these charges could also deal with alleged hush money and, and non-disclosure agreements to women who had accused Trump of, of some sort of relationships. Can, can you address that aspect of the case? For sure. So, it, it, you know, regarding those agreements, first of all, it's possible that, of course, he got financing and, and lied about that financing, just like he did for the medallions. But it, there's also a campaign finance element to it. Uh, w you know, th there's an argument that those con that those payments to those women were related to the campaign, that that money would not have been paid if it wasn't for the timing of the election. And there was pretty substantial sums of money that were paid to some of these women, such as Stormy Daniels. I know there's been a lot of discussion about her. And so if those those um, contributions were related to the campaign, they had to be reported somewhere. And actually, the president himself signed a Federal Election Commission statements attesting that, um, you know, certain amounts of contributions and donations and expenditures were correct. And, and those were not listed. So what could a, a Cohen indictment mean for President Trump going forward? Well, certainly whatever Mr. Cohen knows could potentially be known by prosecutors if Cohen goes forward with flipping, and he certainly seems like he wants to do that. He wants to go towards a cooperation path. That's one problem for the president. Another problem is this is a man who's a close confidant of his, who's closely associated with the president. Now, if he's committed with has committed bank fraud or more, uh, you have yet another person close to the president who's been convicted of a major felony. All right, another Chicago connection, George Papadopoulos, the Chicagoan who in, in many ways ways kicked off this entire investigation. Uh, he had struck a plea deal Although Mueller says he didn't really cooperate in that deal, did he? That's right. You know, there was a lot of speculation earlier on, early on that Papadopoulos would blow things uh, wide open. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, various people he was associated with. Would he cooperate against them? As it turns out, you know, reading, you know, his sentencing is coming up where he, the judge will decide how long he'll be in prison. Uh, and what the Mueller team said was essentially he was not very helpful. Him and his, or his fiance was talking to the press. Uh, and really, um, Papadopoulos had been had deceived them and not been cooperating. Well, I want to throw up a tweet that Papadopoulos uh, sent out today. He and his wife have been all over Twitter nonstop. For sure. uh, so today he, he tweets uh, that it's been a hell of a year and there are a lot of uh, decisions. Uh, that's not that's not the correct tweet. That's Donald Trump. But Papadopoulos says there there's a lot of decisions. There it is. Uh, decisions to make. Uh, what is what is he saying there? It, it's unclear. I, you know, I, I follow him and he follows me back on Twitter. Uh, I've, I've been trying to figure him out for days now. He's been saying a lot of very unusual things. Uh, he seems to me like a man who um, is hard to control. And for, he has an attorney here in Chicago who uh, hopefully will be able to get him a little bit under control. If he was my client, I would advise him to go to Mueller's team and try to make good on the cooperation that he was supposed to have offered so that they'll change the story that they tell the judge uh, that's really the decision that he should be making at this the, point but this behavior where Mueller alleges that he hasn't really been of much help is he trying to play both sides trying to maybe maybe not alienate the the Trump world and and still keep his foot in the the world of Mueller I mean perhaps what he's trying to do is angling for a pardon maybe he's suggesting to the Trump camp that a, if he got a pardon he wouldn't have to go forward and do more for for Mueller or something of that of that nature I will say he and his fiance they seem to be enjoying the publicity and notoriety of this a little too much. Uh, that is something the judge will not like when it comes to sentencing. He'll be better off keeping his head down. On their Twitter feed, they take pictures of themselves all over, all over the city of Chicago. Now, I want to ask you about um, the other news this week. Uh, reports that White House Counsel Don McGahn 
met with the Mueller team for 30 hours uh, of questioning. What are the implications of that? Well, I'll tell you, that is, that's not a good sign for um, the president and his, his efforts. You don't meet with a witness for 30 hours unless they are uh, important and giving something helpful to your side, first of all. Second of all, the fact that the president's team reportedly did not know and was not aware of the extent of his cooperation is a bad sign. You know, now I'm on the other side. I represent people uh, that are being investigated by the government. And when you're in that situation, there's an element of trust that, that, it, that it occurs between the different defense teams. And that usually involves a lot of openness where you're sharing a lot of information. You have a joint defense agreement and you tell each other everything that happens and you try to glean everything you can from the questions that the prosecutor's team is asking. Here, um, McGahn was very mum. His attorney was very mum when he was speaking to the White House about exactly what was going on in terms of cooperation. And really, um, you know, what that suggests to me is that McGahn is not fully on Team Trump. All right, Renato Mariotti, thank you again for your insights. Thank you. And to our next story, by definition, an organic garden is one that doesn't use man-made chemicals like synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. Today, we visited two organic gardens on opposite sides of the city that provides benefits to the environment and nearby communities. We're basically growing carrots inside of there. We've got some beets, more kale, more lettuce, Swiss chard in the corner over there. Since 2002, the Englewood nonprofit Growing Home has provided farm-based job training to Chicagoans with employment barriers, such as criminal records or lack of housing. DeAndre Brooks took a cooking class in 2012, and now he's Growing Home's farm manager. I love teaching the others, you know, how to urban farm and tell them all about the organics of, you know, why it's important that you know, eat healthy. On Mondays, Growing Home students are off. But the business continues. Brooks has an order to fill. Hi, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. wow, these are really great. So you have a mix of um, a lot of different cherry tomatoes. While the rain may be a drag for some, it's a helping hand for farmers. Anytime it rains, is a plus for us. You know what I mean? So we love the rain. We love it. But it's hard to farm in it. Growing Home said 30% of its produce stays in Englewood, a south side neighborhood with few high quality affordable food options. We're trying to push the, you know, the community you know, to have an urban farm, even in their backyards, you know, just try to show them the, you know, the ropes of urban farm. Everything is better fresh right out of the garden. It's crunchy and juicy. <laughs> About 20 miles north on the other side of the city, the Edgewater restaurant Uncommon Ground has been operating an organic rooftop garden for 10 years. Tomato-wise, um, we're like in our peak season right now, and we're getting uh, around 50 pounds a week of tomatoes that we serve right to our guests downstairs. We put them in a lot of our salads, we'll put them even on hummus plates, we'll put them in some of our sandwiches, our burgers, really anything with a tomato in the restaurant this time of year. Beyond the vegetables, herbs, and edible flowers harvested here, the restaurant also keeps bees to help pollinate their crops. These are honeybees, first off. They're an Italian stock of honeybees, so they're really docile. You can see I'm not scared of them at all. Um, they don't want to sting you. They die if they sting you. They really just want to go visit your flowers and pollinate your crops. Uncommon Grounds co-owner Helen Cameron says the 2,500 square feet of rooftop garden produces about 10,000 pounds of food a year. That's only 5 to 10 percent of the food used on their menu. But the environmental benefits and taste of fresh produce is worth it. When you harvest something that is at its peak, it tastes the best, it has the most nutrition, and it makes you so happy because you're literally ingesting, you know, the sunshine and the fresh air. Cameron says urban businesses will need to adopt this model in the future. More people are living in cities now. Uh, we're losing land, um, you know, for farming uh, all over the planet. And so cities are really going to need to start figuring out how to get at least some food growing within the city limits. And as you might already know, we have our own organic garden right here at WTTW. On Wednesday, organic gardener Jeannie Nolan will be back to harvest some more summer crops with Phil Ponce. You can check out our website to learn more about the WTTW garden. Before we go, some viewer feedback. We recently told you about Illinois toughening up its texting while driving law. Starting next July, anyone pulled over for texting while driving will be charged with a moving violation even on the first offense. 
Fantastic. Finally, a law I can fully support. Please put down your phones for your sake and for the sake of everyone in your path. Just another, just another cash grab by Illinois. What about the people eating, putting on makeup, or shaving? Why not just pull over all distracted drivers? One area that is rarely discussed is that each state has thousands of government vehicles. I would love to see one state lead by example and use a program to block texts, redirect incoming phone calls, and impede all other apps in the state vehicles. If we want our state roads to be safer, let's start by making our state vehicles safer. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Monday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily e-alert and join us tomorrow night live at 7. We'll look at the next steps for the Catholic Church after Pope Francis condemns priest sex abuse documented in a massive grand jury report. And the only mosaic school in the country expands to a new and bigger home on the north side of Chicago. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Bob Clifford is on the board of overseers of the Rand Institute for Civil Justice, a think tank in California.